rest of the day. Again, I've been pushing hard, and we're not taking any time for small groups because the camera woman here, Cecil B. DeMilla, is going to be <laughs> leaving uh, by 2. So that we'll have the time after that to do the small groups, to look at your quizaruis, to answer tons of questions. So don't think this is the new normal. This is just something we have to do uh, to get Cecilia here. And yeah, and I'm, not, I'm not announcing what questions you don't have to do um, until the end of the day. Here I wrote down on the board in my lovely hand scratching, this is the verse from John 6, 51. And the bread that I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. And my point is, that is a Exact, a perfect analog for this is my body given for you. This is the synoptic language. This is the Joanine language. So let's line things up. Um, is, that's pretty simple. A different color would help, Mark, huh? How about a, ooh, yeah. ooh, yeah. Okay, so for you corresponds for the life of the world, okay? See that? Okay. My body, my flesh. See that? This is the bread that I shall give. And here's give and give. So it was it was uh, Ray Brown's contention that if you were visiting a Jonine community and they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, this would be the language they would use versus what we use at Mass is the synoptic language. This is my body given for you, which I think is just kind of a clever and amazing thing. But then again, I am I'm a simpleton. I just remember to turn the sound on, so there wasn't anything on the sound there for them. But anyway, so that's, 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 that's that piece. But my plan for the day is, we're going to press on. Uh, we're going to read less as we move deeper. We're going to end at chapter 17. Then we'll take a long break, and then we'll start looking at first your quizaru, and then small groups, questions. That will not be recorded. So we can say whatever we want, and the people who haven't done their tests won't hear the answers. <laughs> Isn't that good? Anyway. They can look it up and cheat. You could cheat. But Jesus is watching, and I'm watching too. He'll tell you. All right, so chapter 11. You know, where the, where the synoptics have a series of shorter little pericopes, we see in John these massive narratives, okay? Again, just a different style. Uh, that, that John uses. The, I, I already spoke about the fourth chapter, the Samaritan woman at the well, and the ninth chapter, the man born blind, as passages that are given to the Sundays in cycle A, the third and fourth Sundays of Lent, during which time those adults preparing for baptism are, are celebrating the scrutinies. And that was one of your homework questions with the scrutinies. So the, the third, the fifth Sunday of Lent in cycle A, or if you have in your parish, if you have um, a, adult uh, candidates, is this one, the, the story of the raising of Lazarus. And the question here obviously is life. What, what does God have in store for us? Life. And Lazarus is the example of that. You know the story very well. Jesus delays when he hears that Lazarus is ill. He delays. Intentionally he delays. So that God's glory might be witnessed to. Verse 20. When Martha heard, so finally Jesus is finally getting there. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. While Mary sat in the house, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
And even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, Ego eimi, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. So first you get a glimpse of the typical idea of life beyond this life as held by those Jews who believed in it. Again, remember, not all Jews believed in life beyond this life. But Martha presents the standard understanding, which is you live, you die. You are in some kind of suspended anima anima animation until the end of time. At the end of time will come judgment day, and then you come to life. See, that? that's Martha's point. Jesus says, no, no, he says, that's not the point. He says, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you die, you shall live. Now, already, not someday, a billion zillion years from now, now it begins. Now you might say, well, but I don't feel any different. <laughs> you know, I don't feel like I'm dancing. You know, uh, again, we need to be, ask ourselves, what is it we expect of our faith? And does our faith not change our attitude and our being? Does it not, does it not have something to say about how we carry ourselves and how we, again, we have dark times, we have troubles, but does my faith not tap me into God who is life indeed. And then Martha though, look at Martha's line. Look at what she puts in that line. Yes, Lord, I believe you are number one, the Christ. Number two, son of God. Number three, he who is coming into the world. Who in another gospel talks that way and gets a great deal of applause for it? Peter. In, now, we've not read Matthew's gospel yet, but that's exactly what Peter says when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One. Now, we make a big, woo-hoo, Peter, rock the church. How come nobody stands and applauds for Martha? I mean that. You know, well done, that's the point, yeah. She makes the exact same testimony that Simon does in the synoptics. Now, I'm not saying she should be popass or whatever. I'm just saying it's the same, it's the same witness. In some ways, women are, the women characters in John's gospel are more deeply developed and more astoundingly positive examples than in Luke or any other gospel. Like Martha, Martha has character. Like the woman at the well, she develops. Mary Magdalene, she's to come. Okay, she's she's in the scene here, but she's you know more to come. Okay. So then Jesus has a similar conversation with with Martha's sister, and then they go on to the cemetery, the graveside. Verse forty-one. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you hear me always, but I have said this on account of the people standing by. So here's an example of Jesus can't pray without the narrator explaining that he's doing that as a demonstration, not because, not because he and the Father aren't always in communion. They're in the most profound communion in John's mind. The narrator feels he has to explain that G why Jesus prays. Okay. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come out!" The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages, and his face wrapped with a cloth. 
Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go. Now keep in mind this idea with bandages. It may seem like a throwaway line. It's going to come back when, when um, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple get to the empty tomb on Easter morning. Okay, This is no accident, this wrapping thing, because there's going to be wrappings that come in the um, in, in that scene. Go back, I'm sorry, I, I meant to read verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now, in John's gospel, remember, Jesus is divine. Huh? He's divine. He shows no emotion other than this. He doesn't, doesn't, you know, so why this emphasis? Uh, commentators struggle with it, but that what's going on here is in, in Lazarus dead, Jesus, this is kind of a little, little bit of the scene that we don't have in John's gospel of Jesus's agony in the garden. Jesus is confronting death, or death is confronting him. And, and so he's not just weeping for his friend. He's weeping about death as a part of our existence, you know, of, of what it means and, and, and how it infiltrates everything in, in what we are and do. Verse 47 is the episode I mentioned this morning where Caiaphas shows that he's a prophet Though he doesn't know it, you hear that phrase. I'm a poet, but my don't, but I, but but but, no, but my feet show it because they're Longfellows. <laughs> Think about it. They got it over there. Why aren't you laughing over here? Okay, Caiaphas is a prophet, though he himself doesn't know it. Verse 47. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, "What are we to do? This man performs many signs." Verse 49, one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. So again, John is showing that that. The, 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 the top, you know, that, that the divine, the heavenly, is interpenetrating the, the, the earthly. Jesus knows who he is and what he's doing. And even characters like Caiaphas are part of the plan, though they don't understand it. Let's go back to chapter 10. In my rush to 11, I forgot, I overlooked 10. 10, we, we typically call the good shepherd. You know, Jesus is a good shepherd. Ultimately, what it begins with, though, is Jesus dissing. It comes right after the man born blind. And at the end of the chapter, we did not read it, but the last verses of the chapter, Jesus talked about the blind seeing, that is, the man born blind, recognizing having faith, and the seeing becoming blind, the Pharisees, who don't recognize him. That's the lead in to chapter 10 where Jesus distinguishes those who are the thieves, who steal the sheep, who climb in over the fence, versus he who is the shepherd, who leads the way. So he's really contrasting himself with them. But in doing so, Jesus explains the meaning of his death. Verse 11 of chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and a shepherd, not a shepherd, whose, whose, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. 
verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This charge I received from my Father. Um, I'm not sure if you're if you've had a practice in your upbringing to be or even with COVID to be able to participate in your church's celebrations of Holy Week. But watch even if you don't. I mean, no shame on you, but you know, I would urge you to. Maybe this year you can do it through you know through um, cameras and virtual, staying at home. On Palm Sunday, we always read a story of the Passion. We read Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And those are stories which, it, you know, Jesus, he, he, we say, Jesus shouldn't have suffered like that. Gosh, if I had been there, if I had been there, I would have stopped it. He shouldn't die. Well, we say John's Gospel, we read it every Good Friday. And the tone of that is very different. The tone is not, this was a miscarriage of justice. That's Luke's version. Remember how many times that the characters, Pilate and Herod and the, and the, the centurion say, this is an innocent man? So it's a miscarriage of justice. John doesn't go there. Or you look at, at Mark's gospel where they, you know, they, they trap Jesus and they run, the disciples run away. And, oh my God, that's terrible. In John's gospel, as you prepare for Holy Week, as you finish your homework, read the, read the rest of John before Holy Week. And you'll notice Jesus is totally in control in the passion. There is no Simon, uh, no, um, uh, he, uh, no, Judas does not plant a kiss on Jesus' cheek in John's gospel. Why? Because Jesus doesn't need to be found out. He's going, yoo-hoo, here I am. Who are you looking for? I am he. I am the one. I am. Jesus makes a deal with the, with the arresting troops. How about if you take me, let these men go? Only in John. Jesus, Jesus is totally... In John's gospel, there's no Simon of Cyrene. Nobody has to help Jesus carry his cross. Jesus is God. Huh? What does God need <laughs> that we could possibly supply? So I, you're going to read a very different story. I told you already about when Jesus says, I am, all the troops collapse. Huh? They all kneel down because it's God. Now, if you told me, had I been there with a camera, would I have seen that? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's what you would have seen, but it's what you should have seen because it's what was happening. They were arresting God. They were arresting God. So here in chapter 10, Jesus explains, no one takes my life from me. It was no accident. It was no miscarriage of justice. I laid my life down fully, freely. It's a saving work that I do. Different, different, different flavor. And that's why we call it not just Friday, or nasty, terrible Friday. We call it Good Friday. I lay down my life for my sheep. It's Good Friday. Again, I'm not trying to dismiss the, the suffering engaged, but in John's mind. So that's so on on Palm Sunday, it's a good day to to sing, Were you there when they when they laid him in the tomb? You know, oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. But on Good Friday, really, if you're listening to John's Gospel, maybe that's not quite the right song. Maybe what wondrous love. What wondrous love is this, oh my, whatever the verses are, huh? The idea, not that, again, yeah, not that Jesus didn't suffer, but I'm just saying in John's mind, this is a wondrous thing. Like your mother giving birth to you, huh? But bigger. I lay down my life freely. No one takes it from me. Now again, if you're parish, they sing, were you there on Good Friday? Don't cause a scene. 
what Father Mark said. No, I'm just saying the the note the 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 the, the, the passion of John is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And again, was it really did it really happen that way? No, it's what it should have happened because it's what it meant. It's what was going really going on. You nailed God to a board. All right, chapter 12. Oh, no, back to 10, sorry, one more verse. This is the thing I quoted already, just so you see it, in this back and forth, chapter 10, verse 33. The Jews answered, it is not for a good work that we stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, made yourself God. Scan up to verse 30. Because this, this is where Jesus says his big line. I and the Father are one. That's the clearest statement in John of Jesus' divine nature. I and the Father are one. All right. Now, to 12. Chapter 12 begins the final week. When we read Mark, remember how things slowed down? Things slow down in John as well. It starts out, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. And here is where the, the scene where Jesus' feet are washed and ointment is poured out. This is parallel to passages that we saw in the other Gospels. Some of the details change in Mark's Gospel. The woman is not named. And it's Jesus' head that gets the attention. Okay, but it's the same setting. It's the same setting. Um, it, so it's, it seems to be kind of a combination of, of, of um, Mark chapter 10, and, uh, or is it chapter 12, and, and Luke, where the, the sinful woman washes Jesus' feet with her tears. In any case, it's the same kind of story, but... They, the Mary pours, the Mary of Bethany pours out this anointment on Jesus' head, on his feet, and on, and on, and wipes them with her hair. Again, Judas Iscariot gets all in her face. Verse 7, Jesus says, let her alone, let her keep it for the day of my burial. So Jesus announces that he knows that this is his last week. Uh, with chapter 12, verse 12 begins Holy Week, in essence. The next day, a great crowd that Jesus was, oh, a great crowd what? A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm and went out to meet him. Sidebar, this is the only gospel that actually makes reference to palms. The other Gospels refer to branches. Don't say what kind of, but here it's, it's Palm Sunday because John says it's palms. That's, that's the only thing that happens. Verse 20, so it's, 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 that, it's that first day Jesus has entered the city. Now among those who were up to worship at the feast, feast being Passover, were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, and said, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So, again, what does glorified mean? They, oh, he's, he becomes king of the world, or he gets lifted up on their shoulders. No, glorified in John's gospel is Jesus' death. Because that's where his divine nature is is fully revealed. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Any who serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. Now, here is this would correspond to the triple announcement of Jesus' passion in Mark between chapters 8 and 10. This is where Jesus lays his cards on the table. He uses that lovely image 
though, of a grain of seed, wheat, that has to destroy itself, has to be consumed, if there's going to be a plant, if there's going to be a harvest. So Jesus is describing his own upcoming passion, and he's inviting his disciples to do the same. With verse 27, there is a moment of self-doubt. Verse 27, now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing by heard it and said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken. So only Jesus hears the Father's voice in words that make sense. They hear, Brum. But what was God saying? Uh, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. So that's Jesus' moment. Jesus is something like the agony in the garden, but it's only momentary. And the Father confirms his role. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. So remember we... We started talking about the book begins with references to testimony and witness. And here we have judgment. But it's the world's judgment. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show by what death he was to die. The crowd answered, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. I said earlier there are three times that Jesus announces or proclaims his impending death, and that each time there's reference to the Son of Man. So this is the third and final time, okay? The first time was in chapter three, and my brain is trying to remember what the second one is, but it can't right now. But in any case, those are, so there are, there are three announcements of Jesus's impending death, like we saw in the synoptics, but in John, the language of son of man is um, linked to them all. If you give me a minute, I have got a little apparatus here that can help me find it. If you just give me a, sense, a moment. Does somebody have the answer already? 828. Well, let's look. Yes! Ding, 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 ding! Who said that? Give that man a cupid doll! <laughs> okay, 828. Or give him another pop. Make him go outside, though. Open up the pop. He exploded a pop can out there before we started here. It's all over the parking lot. If your car can be washed, go see him. <laughs> so those are the three son of man, sons of man references. Okay? Thus ends the book of signs. Okay? Brett? Question? Mm-hmm. Okay, the question was, with the, the strong language about Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as God's son, what does this say about the Jewish community? Great question, Bernie, because when you read the Passion story, the Jewish community comes in for a beating. Um, there, 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 are, you know, there are some churches that, haven't, that don't read the Passion of John on Good Friday, Specifically because the language is so intensely, I don't want to say anti-Semitic, but it's just, it's so strong in judgment. Now remember, if you accept that scenario I presented this morning, that the, that the story behind the gospel is Jewish Christians try to evangelize in the wake of the destruction of the temple, 
Judaism circled the wagons and would not allow people who had those beliefs to stay. They were thrown out. Like anybody thrown out of a club, they become anti-club. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. Jesus is everything for us. And so as Jesus, as the vision of Jesus was raised in the eyes of the, of the Jonine community, their view of the Jewish community became more negative. Painfully negative. Again, when you read the passion story, it will come out. Again, thank God we, that this is not the only gospel we have. If, again, there is no love of enemy here in this gospel. No, no love of neighbor command, actually, as we'll see. And if all we had was John, the, the, ugly, the ugly relationship that Christianity has had with Judaism would, I think, even been more ugly longer or quicker. So, great question. Watch how the text treats, how Jesus' words and the text treats the Jews during the Passion. For this community, Judaism is the past. We're the future. And that leads to a, a concept called subsessionism, which means it, 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 Judaism is, is no longer a saving path for anybody. And the church has stepped back from that. A lot, a lot of preaching of Catholics in the Middle Ages seemed to agree with that, that Judaism was the past, we're the future, we're the only way to salvation. The church has become a little more sensitive. To, remember, we read Paul to the Romans, remember? The promises of God are irrevocable, Romans 11. So, but, I, but the Joannine kind of Judaism is, is, is a mistake view, um, has predom did predominate through much of the Middle Ages. Yes, sir? I should know the answer to this, but I Well, then, know. next question. <laughs> What's your question? Um, this idea of Satan as the ruler of the world, is that Christian concept, or is it rooted in the Old Testament? Woo, that's a great question. Actually, it comes in... You know, it comes in, in Matthew's gospel in the temptation. Remember, uh, Satan says, bow down and worship me, and I will give you the whole world, because it's mine. It's mine to give you. Now, again, the historian, or the, the commentators who talk about this, the story of, I mean, the, the story behind the gospel about the rejection of this Christian community would say that that's what led to the negativity about the cosmos. That, that cosmos is negative. It's a, it's, it's a god. It's when you do things by yourself, that's cosmos. Well, again, but, but again, God so loved the world, too. It's, it's in the same gospel. So you'll find different, in, in that one gospel, you'll find three different approaches. Sometimes our attitude towards the cosmos is it's neutral. Just, it's like the stage on which we play out our lives. Or it's the object of God's love. Or it is Satan's, it's Satan's kingdom. Um, I suspect, back to finally answer your question, I would need to do some research, but I think it goes back to Jewish apocalyptic. Um, Daniel, book of Daniel, and that's two centuries before Christ. At that point, yeah, it's because that's, that's when the heyday of the devil, that's when the devil really becomes a, a, a big entity in the life of the Jewish world. And, and is associated with institutions, nations, you know, uh, be it the, the Mac be it um, the, the Hellenistic, Hellenistic Greeks, be it Rome. I mean, those are the forces of the of the evil one. Yes. Oh, still yes, but its origins go are, are Jewish, apocalyptic. All right. Can we, can we plunge ahead? I promise you this next presentation will not be half an hour. We'll be going to take a big break, and then we can let her go, okay? We're going to do, we're going to do, if you've got the, if your butts have the energy. Okay, can I stop for a second? Take a step, okay, take a seat. Now, she's going to stop, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> Curse and swear and jump up and down. Oh, I'm going to take your silences and okay then. We'll, we'll continue with chapter 13. 13, 14, 15, 16.